Cameron, Tyler, thanks for joining. Um, where are you zooming in from today? Thanks for having yeah. us, Brennan. We're zooming in from Montauk. Nice. <laughs> um, well, can you just give everyone a little bit of background about yourselves and your interest broadly in like crypto and Bitcoin specifically? Because I think you've become the most high profile advocates of of Bitcoin, and I think a lot of people in the real estate industry that obviously we engage with don't know a huge amount about it. So can you kind of just contextualize how you got into the space? Sure, yeah, so the, I guess the real quick version is we started our family office, Winklevoss Capital in 2012 with a focus on sort of early stage startups and investing in technology companies. Um, and then, as we were setting that up, we were on a vacation in Ibiza in the summer of 2012. And some guy recognized us from the social network and started talking and he's like, hey, you guys ever heard of uh, or thought about virtual currency? And we hadn't at the time. And uh, it sounded kind of weird at first. Then after like a shot of tequila, it started to make a lot more sense. <laughs> and when we got, uh, back stateside, we started reading and, 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 and learning and then meeting with Bitcoiners about Bitcoin. And we're just totally blown away by this money built for the internet and this sto the store of value properties, the sort of digital gold nature of Bitcoin. And basically started buying shortly thereafter uh, in sort of uh, the late August, you know, the late summer, early fall of 2012. I think the first coins that we bought were under ten dollars, um, and we've sort of been hooked ever since. Um, in 2015, we launched Gemini, which is a, a cryptocurrency exchange and custodian. But we really do a lot of things, so we we call it kind of like a platform, and it's really to create an easy way for people to buy, sell, and store their Bitcoin. Because when we bought it, it was really risky. It was like the Wild West, and we had to do all these crazy things. To, to buy it and then store it. So we were like, wait a second, this isn't gonna work if it's, if it's too, there's too much friction and risk to get in. Like it's just not gonna go mainstream. So we've sort of been on the Gemini journey for the past five plus years. Um, and then we still you know, are, are really passionate about startups and, and technology. Mm -hmm. That must be one of the- Yeah, so- I was gonna say that, that must be one of the few good ideas to ever come out of a, a visa, maybe the only business idea. Do you think that's right? <laughs> maybe, awesome. we were like, this is either gonna be really expensive and a bad idea, or it's gonna really work out. <laughs> it was a very binary bet. I'm glad the, the interest in Bitcoin uh, lasted beyond the, the sobriety post, post a visa. Um, <laughs> yeah, the hangover wasn't so bad after all. Nice. Um, and can you just explain, like, not to sound like a total Luddite, but like, what is Bitcoin, right? If, if you were explaining it to your grandmother, or if you were explaining it to someone completely outside of FinTech, how would you explain what it is? Like, what is it conceptually, and what is it practically? So I'd say conceptually, I'd start with the fact that Bitcoin is digital gold or gold 2.0. So all of the money characteristics that make Bitcoin, or sorry, gold valuable, the fact that it's scarce, that it's portable, uh, it's durable. Um, Bitcoin has all of those characteristics, but actually is superior in many of them. So the supply of Bitcoin is fixed. Um, you can send it around the world like as easy as an email. So it's more portable. Um, you can divide a Bitcoin into a hundred million pieces. So you don't have to buy one, you can buy a fraction. So if you go down the line of the big characteristics that make gold gold, Bitcoin actually either matches or does better. So that's why we like to start with, hey, it's a gold framework for the same reasons people like gold. You may like Bitcoin, but you may even like it more. And now how it achieves that is, is a deeper conversation. But ultimately, if you think of gold for the internet, 
that works like your email, that's sort of the starting point on, at least for us, the aha moment of like why this could be interesting. Got it. And so, so if you conceptualize it then as like a store of value, um, that there's, I think of gold as kind of a store of value, right? To some extent it still is, but distinct mm -hmm. obviously from like the dollar and like fiat currencies. Cause I can't go to the 7-Eleven with a, a sack of gold and say, hey, I want to buy this Coke with you know this much gold. How do you think about the distinction or the paradox between being a store of value that's perpetual, and I totally understand the notion of it being like a fixed quantity, but the transition then to being a fiat currency and like something that everyone accepts as a store of value for all commercial interchange. Do you think that so, it needs to be that? And do you think it is that today? Um, so a couple of things. Gold, we agree that it's a store of value. It protects your purchasing power. Uh, Bitcoin's an emergent store of value. So it's a little bit, there's more upside to it in the sense that if it becomes a digital gold, um, right now it's trading at about $200 billion market cap. Gold today is probably 9 trillion. So there could be a 40 to 50 X here if we're right that Bitcoin disrupts gold. So it is not quite a store of value today, but rather a store of value in emergent store of value. So it actually has more upside than just investing in gold. Um, I think the value prop here is similar to gold in the sense that if you look at like the, the fiat regimes and what the Fed's doing, gold and Bitcoin are your protection from that scourge of inflation. And so ultimately gold was used, it's a commodity money, it was actually used as um, you know a currency. Um, people paid each other in gold. And then they created representative money, paper that was backed by gold. And because governments wanted to print more money than they had, or wanted to spend more money than they had, in the 70s, we came off the gold standard during the Vietnam War so we could print money and go into debt. Um, and so gold is not used as a currency it can. Bitcoin is not used as a currency it can. But our feeling is that it doesn't have to, just like gold doesn't have to, to play its role. And famously, um, the first Bitcoin transaction was two Papa John pizzas. And the guy paid uh, 30,000 Bitcoin at that time, which at that time when they were worth pennies or fractions of pennies was like 30 bucks. Uh, those pizzas today by today's values, actually it was 10,000 Bitcoin, but today's value is, is just over 10,000. Those two pizzas are $100 million pizzas. So they were really we got good. Just, yeah, the the really good pizzas. Um, so if you spend, you likely may be missing out on upside. So similar to how you may not want to spend your Amazon stock at Starbucks, you spend your fiat currency, which is actually depreciating and losing value. And since the 70s, the dollar's lost like 97% of its purchasing value, whereas like assets like gold have gone up. So we think different assets play different roles. And I don't think gold needs to be spent like a currency to fulfill its promise, its great promise, and, and still have a lot upside. That's interesting. And, both both the what you said about the speculative nature of it, right? That if you were Papa John's and you were speculating and you just held on to that Bitcoin, you would have made a hundred million bucks, right? Um, there's a right. an upside to it. But also that I think a lot of the the dialogue I've seen is around, is Bitcoin gonna replace fiat currencies? Is it going to replace the dollar? And, and what I'm hearing you say is that it actually doesn't need to, meaning there are, different, there are different stores of value and there are different mechanisms we have for conveying value. Some that might be more long-term and represent upside, which I totally appreciate your point about the, the likeness of Bitcoin to gold and being kind of a, a fixed supply or certainly a more fixed supply than dollars. Um, but that currency is more just like what we spend, right? It, it's, it's immediately right. back. You can get paid in your salary and you can also spend your salary very comfortably doing that. Do you think that we have almost like a, like a currency dualism in the future where there's, there's long-term stores of value that may or may not have speculative components to them, but we still maintain dollars, right? We still maintain some kind of fiat currency. I mean, my view is that we've had dualism for a while and we continue to see that. Um, the, the question, so, so 
just hitting on the gold point a little bit more, the above the world's above ground gold stock can pretty much fit into about two two to three Olympic sized swimming pools. That's it. Um, it's actually not a lot of physical gold. Most of that is sitting in central banks or in you know vaults under the Thames River in you know GLD the gold ETF. It doesn't actually ever really move much. Um, and yet it has $9 trillion worth of value or thereabouts. So our view is a store of value doesn't need to necessarily do more than just be a store of value. And I think Bitcoin is more likely to cannibalize gold at least over the next decade than anything else. Um, and then in terms of the US dollar and fiat regimes in general, I think there's an open question. The more sort of shenanigans and bad behavior uh, I mean, the U.S. is we're at twenty-seven trillion dollars in debt and counting. Three of that, I think, was put on in the last, you know, quarter or two. And so, I think that there's going to be a real credibility crisis and sort of a debt reckoning in fiat regimes, and that's going to push people into stores of value like Bitcoin and like gold. You know, obviously, Bitcoin for those who are looking for more of that, you know, speculative um, emergent upside. Um, and to draw to real estate a little bit, um, you know, people store value in homes, in property or whatever, but I think those tend to be probably repriced with, with inflation. So you sort of keep pace, but you're generally not going to beat it. And in the case of real estate, it's obviously not portable and the liquidity is not nearly as uh, liquid as, some, as an asset like Bitcoin. Um, and in situations like COVID, I mean, what, what happens to New York real estate? Um, maybe some places fare better than others. Um, I think, you know, uh, there's going to be winners and losers. So um, that's just a parallel in how we kind of think about it. And in your world, you know, store of value and things like that. Absolutely. And obviously, real estate has long been thought of, or land, even at a more basic level, has long been thought of as like this permanent store of, of value, right? But as kind of economies have internationalized and as we've become kind of so driven by capital markets, you need something obviously that's more fungible, that's more, that's more tradable. So I totally appreciate that. One of the questions I had, because it's a, it has a lot of implications for real estate, the real estate capital markets, is that one of the, the kind of precedent technologies that underlies Bitcoin and its value is the blockchain, right? Um, and I think a lot of people in the real estate industry are kind of notionally interested in the blockchain, but they don't really understand what it means. So you hear a lot of like blockchain for this, blockchain for that. And the real estate industry is intrigued, but doesn't know what that means. Can you explain like, what is the blockchain? What does it do? Why do we have it as kind of a, a constituent of Bitcoin? Like, what is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, blockchain is just a fancy word for ledger, a ledger that's not controlled by a central party like the Bank of America ledger, but it's the ledger of the Bitcoin network. So it's decentralized and everybody has a record of it and no one person controls it. But ultimately, the blockchain says who owns what. In the Bitcoin blockchain, it's basically who owns what Bitcoin. But in other blockchains, the most other exciting blockchain is the Ethereum blockchain. You can actually put a lot of different assets on it. So if Bitcoin is like putting gold onto a blockchain, on Ethereum, people have put securities, stocks that relate to uh, companies or real estate. And also people have figured out ways to put up art in collectibles in a way that is scarce, that's enforced by the blockchain. So, but ultimately there's sort of a scorecard of who owns what, if that makes sense. Got it. And so when you think about that as being kind of this trusted and trusted by virtue of the fact that no one controls it, ledger of who owns what, and therefore everyone can kind of opt into that, that, that same trust. When you think about that as colliding with ownership and property ownership, um, and in particular real estate, I'm curious how you think that'll play out. And, and the reason I highlight it is that, you know, obviously currency markets are the biggest markets in the world, right? Currency is the biggest store of value. But most people don't know this, but real estate capital markets are actually larger than the U.S. debt and the U.S. equity markets. It's, it's the largest capital market mm -hmm. that is U.S. specific. 
And so I've heard a lot of talk about could we put real estate assets, right? Real estate ownership of individual homes or commercial assets or net lease properties. Can we put them on a blockchain? Um, and can we actually have that ledger? And can we then, then therefore trade them more freely? You guys see everything in the space. So what are you seeing around that collision? Real estate capital markets and the blockchain. So I think that, um, you know, if you look at like the closing packet of, of a home or, or any kind of real estate transaction, it's pages, I mean, 50, 100 pages of all this stuff. And you have to transfer titles and things like that. And I think a lot of that can probably be programmatically put into a token on something like the Ethereum blockchain and be represented programmatically and probably reduce a lot of that process. Um, but I think the larger picture is like, can we take some of these assets and tokenize them um, and trade them on a blockchain and reduce some of the friction? And I think the, the, the short answer is yes. I mean, I, I know, um, you know, there's, there's REITs and things that trade on public exchanges, but there's a lot of, you know, brain damage to get up there and you need a certain amount of size and liquidity. But um, in reality, you should be able to tokenize anything. Um, and I think you could reduce a lot of the compliance and costs and paperwork, and quite frankly, just have a better record keeping system, because a lot of this stuff goes missing or this or that. Um, you know, it's literally sometimes physical paper. Um, so we've thought, you know, the tokenization, so the, the world we're in, like where the state of Bitcoin is, a lot of these assets are virtual commodities. And there's this new growing space called decentralized finance. And it's trying to rebuild a lot of like permissionless lending and borrowing and things like that. What I does think that mean, that Cameron, it's, when, you, when you say permissionless lending, what do you mean by that? So basically on the Ethereum network, you can go to smart contracts, post up collateral and borrow a stable coin to then use in the Ethereum ecosystem. So you can literally get a, you can just send value into a smart contract address and get a, a stable coin. DAI stable coin is one of the most popular ones and then use that to go do whatever you want on. Um, so there's no uh, sort of intermediary uh, or well, central well, like. So like, just, just to be clear, like so much of finance is permission based. A bank has to give you permission to open a bank account, a brokerage account, if you're a credit, the SEC accredited investor. So we don't realize this as much because oftentimes we're fortunate enough and privileged enough to get permission to all this access. But many people in the world or even in this country can't even open up a bank account, right? So they don't have permission to be a part of the banking system, the financial system. Um, whereas Ethereum, if you have, let's say on the Ethereum blockchain, you have Ether, you can send it into a decentralized money market protocol and actually earn a yield and no programmer or person is saying, yep, that's, you're allowed or you're not allowed. Um, you just send a transaction to the smart contract on the blockchain, just like you send an email basically. And like Cameron said, you can, you can earn yield, you can do trading strategies, you can borrow. It's really interesting and it's also very new. It's really started to heat up in, in literally this year, um, but it, it's also super global, right? So imagine like, I love the example of try sending money from New York City to London on a Friday night, especially if Monday's a bank holiday. You actually are better off getting on a plane with a bag of money and right. taking the, the, the red eye and getting the cash share because if it's a bank holiday, it's not getting there till Monday, if it's a bank holiday, it's Tuesday. If there's a strike, if you screwed up something with your routing number, it's like Wednesday. And that's how money moves in this world, right? Um, and we know that's crazy because money is just information and we know how quickly email works, right? But it's almost as if your email was only open from nine to five, Monday through Friday. Now that might be kind of fun because we get our lives back and our sanity back, but it's also insane. And so that's how money works, but it actually works as it should on Ethereum and you don't have to charm the authorities or the regulators necessarily to be allowed to partake in it. And I imagine that has huge implications for just enfranchising everyone that is unenfranchised by the traditional banking sector. 
right? That, that just can't get access to financial products, the bank accounts, the mortgages, that you can kind of almost depermission that. So it's just it's just opened and available where everyone, by virtue of having ownership of anything, can secure capital and freely exchange capital and value and ownership. Is that is that kind of is that the opportunity that, that it represents? That's one hundred percent it. Um, and also, if you live in a jurisdiction, let's say like Argentina, you might have access to banking, but because of capital controls, you're stuck in the local currency, which is getting debased and losing all of its value, right? Or defaulting. So you want to get out of that. You want to get into Ethereum, Bitcoin. If you have a data connection on your phone, you can have a digital wallet. You can be your own bank. You can start saving in Bitcoin and Ethereum. You can start spending in some of the stable coins on the Ethereum network. Actually, Gemini has a wrapped US dollar stable coin. There's also decentralized uh, stable coins called DAI. So you can do sort of your currency work in stable coins on Ethereum. You can save your paychecks into um, stores of value like Bitcoin or Ether. And you actually can try and earn some yield in these zero or negative interest rate environment by working with some of these, these projects that offer yield by lending or you can borrow and there's even um this concept called staking where you can contribute to the mining of the network um and earn yield based on that it's sort of like bonding to the network like having a t-bill back in the days when t-bill would actually earn you earn you some uh yield so it's really fascinating and ultimately what we're seeing is that it's this complete alternative to the current system a lot of people are fed up the current system sort of um goes into crisis a lot, right? Um, there's a lot of money printing. As we said before, it's like, we don't think Bitcoin's gonna disrupt fiat, the dollar. I think it's really the, the race is between Bitcoin and, and gold. The question is, is the dollar gonna disrupt itself? When you look at the, the deficit spending, you know, a billion used to be a big deal, now it's trillions, all of a sudden the pandemic, a couple more trillions. Um, when you just start doing the, and, and, you know, I don't think a country's ever turned the money printer off. So we keep going down this path. But when you start looking at the the math around servicing this debt, the ballooning, it's just becoming like losing like credibility and becoming hard to like at some point the US dollar bag holders or the, the debt holders to the US government be like, hey, there's this is like clearly bankrupt and people clearly won't be able to or the government won't be able to pay this back. Like what do we do? And so we're seeing a lot of Wall Street veterans, actually, especially through like their family offices, understand the gold framework for uh, for Bitcoin and be very spooked by what's been happening up to the pandemic and then what we've had to do um, to get through it. Because we spent, uh, we lowered taxes, we increased deficit spending, we went into debt during the biggest bull run, I think the biggest bull run ever in US economic history over the decade coming out of 08, right? So we sort of did everything we shouldn't have done. We didn't tighten our belt, we didn't save, we just kept hitting the turbo. And then all of a sudden this black swan event, uh, COVID pandemic happens, and we had no choice but to hit that turbo again to get through it. And so all of a sudden we went, you know, uh, you know, a trillion dollars a year was every year stacking up and then a couple more trillion. And it's sort of like at some point people are just starting to scratch your head and be like, I'm really scared, you know, about right. the dollar. Now, it is a global reserve currency. Um, it's afforded a lot of things that other currencies aren't. Um, but we're definitely getting into some really unchartered territory. And your best hedge to that is either gold or Bitcoin, but a lot of the, the sort of the, the Gen Zers and millennials, they don't have these like money memes burned in their head of like the US dollar is money and you know, all this stuff. They're totally open, right? They're a blank slate. They're, they're going to Robinhood. They're learning how to invest in stocks or at least attempting to. They're sort of looking for more financial independence. And they're also really interested in cryptocurrency because it's this new system that's enforced by math it's more democratic and it's really not, it's not 12 people behind the curtain at the Fed making all the decisions, right? It's transparent, it's open, it's code based. So it's just, it offers a new alternative. And I think that's really resonating with people, especially during this time. Especially the, what you were mentioning about the smart contracts and how much bureaucracy right now is required to enforce contracts. And I'm just thinking about 
you gave the example, I think Cameron, of like closing a home, right? And you get your closing statement. The process of closing a home is like so antiquated and is rife with bureaucracy. Because literally it's the seller, right, is, is posting the asset. They're giving the asset to the buyer. But there's an escrow and closing agent, which is the equivalent of like a, a human bureaucratic instantiation of a smart contract, which sits there and says, okay, I'm taking deed to the property. And then the buyer is conveying the whatever equity, right? The, the, the cash equity that they're contributing. Right. And the mortgage, right, needs to flow in as well. And once all these things are checked, we can actually clear the transaction. And the buyer and the seller can trust that the closing and escrow agent is the equivalent of like a smart contract to, to make sure right. that everything goes the right way before the exchange happens. And kind of what you're saying, it sounds like, is that you could almost replace all of that process, all of that bureaucracy, all of that friction and all the fees that need to get paid with an algorithm, right? That's just algorithmic. If you're selling me a house, Cameron, and I'm buying the house, of course we may not trust each other that I'm gonna wire you the money before I get the house, but the third party can be algorithmic. Is that kind of what you're saying with a smart contract? Yeah, you laid it out really well. And the, like, the settlement ultimately relies on the legal system which ultimately relies on force. It, 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 you know, if, if you close on a house and then you try to, you know, you don't put your money in or whatever, ultimately it will go to a system. What is the cost for that system to exist to then enforce it? And it becomes sort of a forceful settlement. Whereas uh, a smart contract is all code. And so it's effective, it's peaceful settlement. Um, and it's atomistic. It happens as soon as that value sort of changes hands, uh, in real time. Um, so the, the amount of cost that you sort of articulated well is, is enormous um, and it happens all day long and it's, you know, and this technology really allows us to cut a tremendous amount of that out. Um, so it's like super exciting, the scalability, the efficiencies long-term. Right, and, and, and just sort of taking that example, right? So two parties could agree could agree on a smart contract that requires both parties to fulfill some sort of promise. I send in the right amount of ether um, and you send in the title or, you know, the, the, the title to the property to the contract. The contract says, Oh, both demands were met or fulfilled. Now I'm going to shoot the ether to the other party and the title contract together. And that's just like two parties sending an email and code enforcing the logic that they agreed upon. And it replaces the legal system, the lawyers, and even the armies to enforce the judgments and knock on your door and say, hey, you got, <laughs> now you gotta give up this house. Um, and, and it's the same thing with, with Bitcoin also in the banking system. Uh, bank branches, brick and mortar branches, aren't gonna get to far corners of the world that need them, like JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. They're not gonna staff that up, build a, you know, a bank branch and whatnot. But if you have a data connection, you replace all that with software and math, right? So someone can get a Bitcoin private, uh, address or wallet, an Ethereum wallet, and I can actually send them Ether or they can get Ether, right? And they have their own bank account there without any of the infrastructure of the offline world. Um, so it's, it's like the internet go, it goes wherever the internet goes. So you, you've got this software infrastructure that's replacing all of this brick and mortar infrastructure, whether it be a banking branch, a stock exchange, or um, in the context of a, a court system or in notaries and all those different things to, to, to move real estate. So um, it's sort of like snail mail to email. You know, yeah. all of a sudden I can be on this call right now or the Zoom and email you guys back and forth. I'm never going to send you snail mail. So like all of a sudden I can communicate in a way that we couldn't before. And it should bring tremendous more liquidity and price discovery, um, just like the invention of the stock exchange, the, 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 um, the company, the, you know, a company, a joint stock company in the 1700s. And then the stock exchange where people could, oh, we, we can trade these shares in this company. Those were financial inventions that dramatically changed the course of financial and economic history in the world. And we think that blockchains have the, have the uh, opportunity to sort of replace that with efficiencies, more liquidity, make it more global, more price discovery, um, and just 
take all those costs because that's really expensive to to put in bank branches and put you know all that stuff that we have now and we have a better way we're getting yeah, there so it's interesting that the, the concept you brought up of like the joint stock companies right going back to like european history i mean that innovation mm -hmm. is effectively like atomized and kind of like made much more granular the ownership of anything in this case a company but one of the challenges that persists in the real estate industry is it's very hard to atomize real estate right it is a single asset right. in the case of residential real estate it, there's an occupier there's the owner that 99 percent of the time the owner of the home uses the home right that they are using that particular home and in the case of commercial real estate obviously you're leasing it out but regardless you can't you can't discover value you use this term price discovery but you know, a, a given real estate asset, say on Fifth Avenue in New York, that might trade in 2007, and then again it trades 10 years later in 2017, and then again it trades 20 years, 10 years later in 2027. And you're only getting these snapshots at a point in time <laughs> how that value is trading, and then the real estate owner can go get a mortgage. But it's almost like if you could atomize ownership and render that granular ownership much more liquid to freely trade your mortgage could almost be the equivalent of um like margin on your stock right so so it's freely floating and so you're never over levered because you have a capital call if the asset loses value and your mortgage stays static um do you think that's the future of where real estate capital markets are headed because today we have that in in like REITs these public REITs which are big portfolios of real estate assets but do you think individual assets will be tokenized, right? And they will trade and there'll be price discovery probably hundreds of times a minute maybe on those assets like the stock market. And then mortgages will just sit as like leverage against those stores of value and real estate owners can freely decide how much they want to lever their given assets. And, that, and I guess, does that do two things? One, does that make real estate markets more efficient? And two, does that enfranchise people, um, as you made this point earlier about enfranchising people that can't get access to capital markets, does that let them get access to real estate in a way that they can't? If you're the average American, you can't buy commercial real estate directly, but this would kind of enable mm -hmm. it. I know it's a big question, so I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not sure I might be venturing out of my depth a little bit, but I do think that, um, look, if I see, if I, li I live in Manhattan, if I see that Long Island, the city is a growth play, um, I think today I have to go buy property or a building or maybe find a, a, some sort of REIT that's indexing it. But that's a but huge think, unit of denomination, right? To buy yeah, a right. That's like, a lot of money. that's like owning one Bitcoin and not realizing you can buy a fraction or a hundred dollars right. of Bitcoin. Um, so I do think there's a possibility where I could buy tokens that represent just a fraction of that region. Or if I believe in downtown Manhattan or uptown, I can start creating baskets and buy small like mini chunks that are tokenized because it's so atomized, it's so liquid. Um, so this idea that, yeah, I'd love to like put 500 bucks long on Long Island City or, or Brooklyn or Williamsburg, um, I think that's possible. Today, it feels like it's not. Um, and I judge that based on the fact that I never hear people doing that and I wouldn't even know where to start. But I think that is, um, you know, a, a path that's possible with this. Like, oh, I really love the Dunkin' Donuts. Well, on the not only, I would, I would say <laughs> not only is it possible, but we're actually, we have a broker dealer application and an ATS under file with the SEC. Um, in the hopes that security tokens are going to be a really exciting part and growth area of the crypto market. It's taken a little bit of time because it's so new and novel, but the idea that you could uh, build atomistic shareholders in really any property, I think is totally going to happen over the next you know, decade. And so picture, you know, why couldn't you buy a hundred dollar share in your corner coffee shop? You know, I don't, I don't see why that wouldn't be possible. The, or, or to your point, like um, Fifth Avenue real estate, those buildings may not trade, you know, every 10, 20 years. So 
you don't really have a way to market to market, but you could take a sliver of it um, and tokenize that and then let people trade. And um, investors are excited because that's, you know, they, they didn't previously have access to that kind of commercial real estate. The owner has a lot more liquidity, price discovery, all the stuff that sort of comes with having a trade, um, you know, uh, on a much more like regular basis. And so I think that um, that future, or even if you wanted to, you know, buy an apartment or something, let's say you had like 10 different owners in some piece of real estate that had cash flow, you could also have a governance token where the owners could sort of vote how to, you know, whether to sell it at some point um, and have all kinds of like drag along rights. There's, there's all this stuff you can do with, with basically software and tokens that you can't currently do because either the people are so far removed, they don't have the ability to buy a building outright. Um, and so it really creates these, these abilities of like price discovery and liquidity that just aren't possible in, in the current system. And the capital formation is global. Mm -hmm. So it's literally like sending an email for someone in Indonesia or anywhere in the world to actually uh, invest in that region, you know, that bodega on the corner. So if you're the owner or the landlord or whatever, um, your access to capital, the capital formation is just so much greater. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I think about, I think this was a app that like maybe E-Trade developed like, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, we're seeing it, but it was basically like on your phone, you could scan a barcode and it, of any product, any consumer product out there. And it would tell you who, if a public company made that product, and then you could just instantly buy stock in that company. It's kind of interesting because, you know, consumers right. have intuitions about, I like this product, right. I don't like that product. And it kind of democratizes information flows in the sense that they can now just invest in the things that, that they know. And it's so interesting to think that if you walked into a coffee shop, to your example, you could, you know, just say, oh, this particular address, maybe you scan something, maybe it just, you know, pushes it to you. And you're like, I want to take an ownership position in this particular building, or maybe even this particular coffee shop, the actual operator. Right. And like, right. how that changes capital flows is, is fascinating. Yeah. And, and like, look no further than Airbnb, right? Yeah. Think, think of like all of the transactions that are happening today that weren't really possible or feasible pre Airbnb. Um, there's all this sort of like dead weight real estate loss when you're not using your home that it'd be amazing to, to rent out and earn income on that. And I think it's also created like a lot more movement among people where, you know, you don't have to take like a residence for like a, a month or rent something for like a long term. You could try a different, you know, place all the time. So it's like better for the, the end user. It's better for the, the person who owns real estate because there's so much more discovery because of this, you know, that platform. And that's not even sort of blockchain and, and some of the stuff we're talking about. But the idea, like, I think we can, there will be an Airbnb equivalent for sort of ownership, not just sort of the rental connecting right. renters to, to landlords. And that's going to be uh, a really interesting future. You walk into a coffee shop and you buy a cold brew, um, and you say, you know, I think I might also buy a hundred dollar share of this business. I, I, you know, lived in this neighborhood for a while. I see that the student traffic come through. Um, I sort of see how they manage it. They run it. I want to be long this coffee shop. Yeah, you have a consumer be intuition that there's value here and you want to participate. In it. Exactly. Um, I like Cameron. I like that point you made about also like the governance um, there are tokens that don't necessarily have economic value, but have the c control, the governance of the protocol or, or the, let's say the, the building. So, you know, raise rates, sell this and that, um, instead of sending on emails or getting people on the phone, you know, you just vote with your token, like sending an email and all of that process is super efficient. And it can also be very democratic. Whoever owns the token gets to vote. So presumably if you buy, into the real estate or the asset you want the governance token too but you don't necessarily have to have it um 
But I, I kind of like, I love the, also the Airbnb point. It's like, number one, you had to buy a CD to listen to the, the one song you wanted. Well, maybe you don't have to buy like the whole CD with all those crappy songs. You just want the one or two. Right. Um, so now you can just kind of buy song by song basis. And that whole model of like, you got to buy a whole building to have exposure or to be a landlord, you can actually buy little things or even half units or, or whatever. Um, and I think that's just a much more interesting, healthy environment. Like, you know, if you think of like a barrier reef system, you've got these big fish and these little fish or whatever, whatever they're called. Um, but I think it's just like a healthier ecosystem. Um, and uh, it's like that movie, The Holiday. I don't know if you've seen it when they swap houses. Like, it's a good one. Watch it every holiday season. Um, <laughs> that, wouldn't, that movie wouldn't have happened without right. this. And, and I'm curious to get your just last thing on, on real estate and the blockchain, because it's a space we looked at for a while and it's such a crazy industry, but I really do hope that blockchain finds a way to just systemically improve title insurance. Most people don't even know what title insurance is, but like it's this bizarre kind of insurance where you actually have to buy insurance that you own the asset you appropriately own that given asset, a given piece of land and a given building, free and clear of any encumbrances, right? So someone that, that claims to own it as well. And it's interesting because it was developed because it used to be that, you know, I'd buy a plot of land or I'd buy a house and then you, Tyler, would be like, no, no, I own, I actually own that house or I own a third of your front yard and we'd get in this conflict and we'd go to the legal system and we'd resolve it. And so title insurance evolved as this way of ensuring that you actually do have title you own a given home and it's crazy because title fraud like where actually people are lying about owning things they don't is very very low in the u.s most of this is just like someone right. did roofing work on your house five years ago and you never paid them and then when you go to sell the house they're like oh you have this debt you have to settle before you can ultimately sell it but it's crazy because Every time you buy a house and every time you get a mortgage and every time you even want to refinance your mortgage, you have to go buy a new title insurance policy. It's a $15 billion industry in the U.S. And just hearing both of you talk about blockchain, I mean, this is the simplest thing to render through a ledger that's high trust, right? Where there's nobody that can doctor it. You can just say that 101 Main Street is owned by title until he decides to sell it to Brendan. And in the example of tokenization or kind of atomizing ownership, Brendan bought 50% of it, but there's no disputing it because it's a highly knowable thing. It's, it's land, it's, there's nothing more fixed than land. Have you seen anything that is purporting to like disrupt this bizarre, but gigantic antiquated industry of title insurance in, in all your dealings in crypto and blockchain? But it sounds like it's super ripe for this type of application. My guess, though, is it's a legal requirement by law, yeah. right? And insurance companies probably really enjoy that law being in place. Um, so that might be a little bit challenging to disrupt that $15 billion. I mean, it's a silly risk, right? And the insurance companies love insuring risks that are never really going to come to fruition. That is the business model. Um, I think that it's totally... It, I, I don't think we've seen, I personally haven't seen anything specifically trying to tackle that problem, but there's definitely in decentralized finance, there are already efforts underway to build sort of um, pools, risk pools, where people can come in, become members, and basically choose which risks they want to um, insure. And right now it's focused on, a lot of them are focused on smart contract uh, risks and if there's a failure, it's it's sort of easy to verify whether the code worked as intended, and that's kind of the starting point. Nexus Mutual is is a company that's focused on that, but long term, you know, they would definitely, you know, the, the plan is to broaden out to really any type of insurance. And what's cool about you know you you could build like parametric contracts around hurricane insurance. Or, 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 or flood levels. If the, if the, using an oracle, if the, if the water line gets to a certain point, it pays out. And the oracle, you, you, know, you, you choose whichever oracle you're gonna use. 
And I think, um, so I'm not sure, like title insurance is definitely one area, but really what about flood insurance on real estate? Mm -hmm. um, there's many, many coastal zones where you just can't, you can't get um, insurance. And, and you don't even have to like argue over the damage. You could take insurance based on like the, 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 the sea level, you know, like objectively reach. So the event just occurs in and of itself and it pays out yeah and as a homeowner you know if it reaches that you're going to have some damage so you just go off this objective measure and when cameron says parametric it's just a parameter based thing like did the yankees win the baseball game yesterday yes or no pay out right. um and so the that can all be enforced with logic of smart contracts and code so again you don't need the court system the judges the lawyers it happens real time instantaneously yeah, right and and the settlement sorry, happens, yeah. money's changed. Yep, go ahead, Karen. I was just gonna say, think of like a, a fire or, or natural disaster insurance in California right now. That's probably pretty hard to come by. There's all kinds of exclusions, but there may be people around the world who have a different viewpoint on sort of what that risk is for the next decade. They want, willing to, take they it want to underwrite that risk. They want to take they do. it. Yeah. But the traditional insurers are just at capacity or they've decided internally they are no longer going to underwrite it. It's just too risky. And you have a different point of view or different knowledge set and you're willing to do. You can't uh, currently do that. But with smart contracts and what we were talking about, you could take that side and people could get flood insurance in zones that historically just are underserved or not served at all. Um, and I think it's a, I think that application of real estate is, is, is really interesting and probably likely to, to evolve pretty quickly. So, so Cameron, um, going back to that example, it's almost like a mutualized insurance pool, right? It's not like a company, but it's people who put money into this pool to earn a yield, um, to sort of ensure an event that's, by, that's very logical, right? That everyone can objectively agree upon. So it's a different model of insurance. It's actually an earlier one, but we couldn't, we can't scale that earlier one. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so prior, so basically like uh, um, mutuals, um, discretionary mutuals are sort of the earliest kind of model of insurance. Um, that's my understanding. And so people would sort of agree to have discretion on, you know, elders would have discretion on whether to pay out the insurance. The challenge of that is those were more localized. And so, um, you know, I think when you can diversify your risk, it, it's, it's a better situation. So that sort of led to the advent of, of insurance companies because you can build all this portfolio of risk that is diversified. Um, and I think that, um, so, so that's kind of the, the advent and you couldn't do mutual sort of at scale with diversified risk, but with smart contracts, you can build a pool of diversified risks that the group wants to do that is sort of scalable beyond kind of the localized uh, network. And, and the payout doesn't have to be necessarily tied to like an objective event. It could be people with the governance tokens just being like, hey, it's a good idea to cover this amount because we, we don't wanna burn these people, we want a good experience so people come back into the pool and use us. So it's really interesting because you're not, again, you're not going to court, um, it's sort of like the 9-11, the right? The World Trade Center, like was it two events or one event? Is it one insurance payout or two? Well, there was two planes, you know, they both hit, but it was really, it's called 9-11, it's one event. So you fight that in a court system for 10 years on the payout, whereas the, the governance token holders of this pool can say, hey, I'm voting it's one, you're voting it's two, whatever. And almost like, yeah, it's our, it happens. That's a good point, sorry. So, to, and, and just to like further kind of refine, like the, the pools, like these mutualized pools um, are really efficient. You just couldn't build scale and diversify your risks. So insurance companies have this ability to diversify risk, but they're not like claims, uh, uh, determinations of claims and that process, if there's a dispute is not efficient because you again, are, you're going back. It rests, going with the, it rests with the insurer, right? It, it, it's actually their prerogative. And if the insurer doesn't agree, as, as Tyler was describing, they have to take it to the courts. And there's a dispute over whether the policy 
actually states that, you know, whatever the event is, it actually qualifies under your policy. Right. And policies today going to trial were likely written 10 years ago. Right. And the juries deciding them are, are built of laypersons. They're often dealing with complex issues. Um, and so how do you underwrite risk that's, you know, could come to a head a decade down the road? So it's like, it's a hard thing to underwrite and, and deal with. And I love the idea that a smart contract and a group of members with a, with a governance token can really quickly, efficiently determine whether they're going to pay out. And if they do a bad job or they're not fair, people just won't lose, use the pool and it will kind of go elsewhere. But I think there's a tremendous amount of sort of efficiencies um, to be gained in that particular area. And also capacity, if you're a real estate owner, to find capacity in risk that you, you literally cannot find. Yeah, and I think real estate owners today are grappling with dimensions of risk they never contemplate, mm -hmm. right? Dimensions of risk related to a pandemic, obviously dimensions of risk related to climate change, sea level rise, hurricanes, fires, but then also risk related to like just population movements, right? We are kind of in, in the midst of probably like the greatest reshuffling of the deck of where people are moving on account of like virtual work environments and tax law and everything. And so it's interesting to think about all of the risks that real estate owners bear when they buy and operate a given asset and how much of that risk can be framed and appropriately priced, right, with the right mechanisms. And, and that runs a spectrum. There's kind of a continuum of like the most, as I was saying before, title insurance is kind of absurd because it's like the most knowable thing, right? It's like, it's like how much should I pay for an insurance contract that I don't have red hair. Well, it's a knowable thing, right? I shouldn't pay much for that insurance contract. You sure you don't have red hair, Brennan? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Maybe I do. Maybe I'm just particularly colorblind. Um, but no, like title insurance is that, but then along that spectrum, there's all these eventualities like we were just describing that you can mechanize, it sounds like with these governance tokens and pooling risk that in some ways democratize insurance and democratizing insurance is a huge benefit in terms of the cost of capital because insurance is a big cost for real estate owners. So it's a really interesting area of innovation around this space. Yeah. So, yep. Well, I guess, look, I feel like we could talk about all the, the applications of, of crypto and, and, and blockchain on real estate and real estate capital markets for like another three hours. Um, but this has been so interesting. It's, it's awesome to just pick your guys' brains on, you know, what all of this innovation in this category, which, you know, you guys are such big advocates for, how that will have downstream effects on real estate and real estate capital markets, which I think everyone in the real estate industry is trying to figure out, especially now. So Cameron, Tyler, thank you so much for, for sharing your views. Thanks, Brennan. Welcome. Yeah, really thanks fun. for having us, Brennan. It was really fun. Awesome. All right. See you guys. See you Take later. Easy.